Welcome back to The Emily Show. Today we are talking about the next trial I'm going to be covering. It is going to be a contentious one, and it is kicking off with jury selection on April 16th. I'm not sure how long jury selection will take. At hearings last week, the court indicated that they would be voir dire-ing jurors one by one. So I don't know how long this is going to take, but we are going to be spending the next five or six weeks with the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Was this a murder or is it a cover-up? That's what we're going to talk about today. Let's get in to The Emily Show. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Factor. Factor is chef-prepared meals delivered directly to your door that are ready in like literally two minutes. I can't tell you how thankful I am that I have found the Factor meals ahead of trial coverage in this case because it is how I am going to be eating lunch and you have seen me eating Factor meals on stream during other gavel to gavel trial coverage when I am busy. The only problem I have with Factor is that my husband loves them too and we never seem to order enough. So I am working on making sure that everyone has lunch for the week. And that is where I use Factor the most is to make sure I have lunch. Though if you need quick dinners in the evening, they work great for that too. They are no fuss meals. So if grocery shopping and all of the executive functioning it takes to get food on the table for yourself or others is just not working for you right now, give Factor a try. They have a wide variety of meals and you can choose from all sorts of premium ingredients like filet mignon and shrimp, truffle butter, which I absolutely love, and broccolini, which I really very much enjoy if I'm gonna eat a vegetable. So make sure you head to factormeals.com slash EDB50 and use code EDB50 to get 50% off your first box and 20% off your next box. That's code EDB50 at factormeals.com slash EDB50 to get 50% off your first box and 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Let's get back to today's episode. When I said this case was going to be contentious, there is quite a lot going on around this case, around the internet, and not just around the internet, but also in the town of Canton, Massachusetts, which is a community that has uh, deep, deep ties to the individuals involved in this case, a community where people live for generations, and the community has been pulled apart as well as the internet by those following this case closely. If you've not been following this case closely, I've got you. We're going to do an overview today. I really want to go into this case as a juror. I am going to overview generally the prosecution's allegations, what the defense is rebutting it with, the very, very odd circumstance of, at this point, a year-long at least federal investigation, including a federal grand jury, investigating, it seems, the investigation and prosecution of Karen Reed, which is a very unusual circumstance. The fact that the defense and prosecution have agreed and asked for continuances and the judge says no. I was watching part of a hearing from Friday, April 12th, for the last motions and motions in limine ahead of the trial. And there were motions that both parties agreed on and the judge is like, well, I actually don't know if I agree with you. I'm like, I'm sorry, what is happening in this courtroom right now? And the judge was like, no, I'm not going to um, tie the witness's hands like that. And that was specifically on the issue of witness intimidation and witness harassment, which has been alleged uh, to be quite widespread in this case. And I think a lot of that stems from how contentious this case is, how high profile it has become, the intense regional division on this case, and, well the outstanding question is this the murder of john o'keefe or is this a cover-up of the murder of john o'keefe and that's really what i want to see play out in court so my approach to all of this is i have questions and from the first time i looked at this case i was like i have a lot 
of questions. And I want to watch this case without a ton of outside information to see which side either answers those questions or doesn't answer those questions at the end of a criminal trial. If your questions are not answered, well, that is reasonable doubt. And I'm not sure how this case is going to go. I'm also particularly interested. One, one of the prosecutor's last name is Morrissey. And trying to keep that prosecutor and Carrie Morrissey from the Rust case separate in my brain is going to be interesting. And two, one of the lead defense attorneys is an attorney from Los Angeles, a former prosecutor who prosecuted the Phil Spector case, among others, who was at the office at the same time I was at the office, but also was the defense attorney and is now a high profile defense attorney for Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey. But what I know from previously seeing Alan Jackson in trial is that he is a very, very good trial lawyer. But I wonder what being a very high profile Los Angeles defense attorney will play like in this Massachusetts courtroom. Also, we haven't covered a Massachusetts case on this channel yet. And some of you may disagree and you are always welcome to disagree with me but i'm ready for some massachusetts accents look we have covered some a lot of south carolina and this is going to be a vast departure just a vast vast departure but i also spent you know the beginning part of my collegiate career at umass amherst and i loved loved the boston accent but every time i went out people were like where are you from you know um because it's clear, like, she doesn't go here. I was like, California, they're like, mm, sounds like it. I was like, yeah, yeah, it probably does. I, I used to do a much better Boston accent. I will say, I don't do a very good one anymore. But after five, six weeks of trial, maybe that will change. We picked up South Carolina pretty well. So let's take a look first at the indictment and the charges. This indictment is from June... 22nd it actually says the second thursday of june 2022 which is very confusing to me like can you just tell me what day it is it should be noted that this is the second charging of karen reed she was originally charged with fewer charges than the um second degree murder was added so we're going to go through these uh, this is charging Karen Reed of Mansfield in the county of Bristol on or about January 29th, 2022 at Counton in the county of Norfolk did assault and beat John O'Keefe with intent to murder such a person and by such assault and battery did kill and murder the said John O'Keefe. Yes, I am reading this indictment verbatim and is guilty of murder in the second degree and not in the first degree in violation of the MGL code section 265 subsection one they end this for their grand jury with against the peace of said commonwealth and contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided we're going to talk about some of the other um unique aspects of this jurisdiction when we get to some of the things the judge has sealed oh now i've spilled the punchline uh which in their courts is not called sealed it is called impounded i have never heard of a court impounding documents welcome to massachusetts friends all right the second charge karen reed did operate a motor vehicle upon a way as described in the code or in a place to which the public has the right of access or upon a way by way they mean street or road or in a place to which members of the public have access as invitees or licensees with the percentage by weight of alcohol in her blood of eight one hundredths or greater or well under the influence of intoxicating liquor and did so operate said motor vehicles so that the lives and safety of the public might be endangered and by such wanton and reckless conduct as so described did cause the death of another person to wit John O'Keefe. So this is charged as a second degree murder and also a, a DUI or as they refer to it is an OWI operating under the influence causing death. The third cause of action against Karen Reed is did operate a motor vehicle upon way or in place in which the public has a right of access. And then we're going to truncate that a little bit and without stopping and making known her name, residence and the registration number of her motor vehicle did go away or avoid prosecution or evade apprehension after knowingly colliding with or otherwise causing injury to John O'Keefe, such injuries having resulted in death 
of said person. That is the third cause of action. So what does all that mean? It means that there are three charges against Karen Reed. Second degree murder, driving under the influence or OWI and causing a death and leaving the scene of an accident that resulted in death. So it is a hit and run, driving under the influence resulting in death and second degree murder. So let's talk about what the state's perspective of this case is, what the defense perspective of the case is, and that very unusual federal investigation. Starting with the prosecution, because that's the very beginning and they're gonna present their case first once they pick a jury, which I think is gonna take a bit longer than in other cases that we have covered. So this is just a reminder, if you're ready for gavel to gavel coverage, Lawnard app is going to help because I don't know when they're gonna finish picking this jury. Some of the court days are gonna be half days. So if you wanna make sure that you don't miss a thing in this weeks long trial, lawnardapp.com or just put Lawnard in your app store. Prosecution's case. The prosecution is alleging that Karen Reed, while driving drunk, hit John O'Keefe with her car and left him to die in the snow. The evening that we are talking about, kind of the overnight into January 29th, 2022, they had a big nor'easter come through and quite a lot of snow, which is a factor that is going to be discussed quite a lot. Those of you that live in snow areas, some of the things you're going to look at in this case and be like, huh, that's strange. There are environmental factors here that I think will come into play during evidence that will be very much known to a local jury. And we will discuss for those that live in the more snowy regions and less snowy regions of the United States. Because again, if you've never lived in snow, um, as I hadn't for most of my life, it's a whole other situation. That is the basic premise of the prosecution's case. The defense's case is that this is a cover up and the investigation was compromised by the close personal relationships of those who lived where O'Keefe died and the responding officers. The defense is arguing that John O'Keefe was beaten inside the home where Reed had dropped him off and then he was left outside in the snow to die. Keeping in mind that John O'Keefe was a Boston Police Department officer, others involved here are Boston Police Department officers. There is one federal officer from ATF whose name also comes up quite a bit in this and will be a witness to this case. Leading up to the death of John O'Keefe on January 29th, 2022, the state is alleging that John and Karen had been arguing that the relationship had hit a couple of rough patches and that John O'Keefe's niece told police that she had heard them fighting and that she had heard John tell Karen that their relationship is over. We will be hearing from at least the niece. I don't know if we will also hear from the nephew when this case goes to trial later this week or early next week. John's niece and nephew lived with him after his sister had passed away and shortly after his sister passed away his brother passed away and he took custody of his niece and nephew and karen reed often stayed with them as well the night of january 28th 2022 john o'keefe and karen reed went out at about 7 30 7 40 in the evening to cf mccarthy's in canton uh they were drinking there surveillance shows the bartender providing drinks to karen reed between the hours of like 7.47 and 10.22, about six drinks and some shots. Karen Reed had been drinking like vodka sodas. Uh, John had been drinking beer. At 10.40, they leave that bar and head to the Waterfall Bar and Grill also in Canton. At the Waterfall Bar and Grill, they run into friends, Chris Albert, his brother Brian Albert, who is also a Boston police officer, and Jennifer McCabe, who is Brian's sister-in-law. Brian Albert invited the group back to his house, and Reed gave O'Keefe a ride to that house in her black Lexus SUV to 34 Fairview Road. That house becomes quite important. That's where John O'Keefe is found in the early morning hours of January 29th, 2022. Thank you to today's sponsor, Thrive Cosmetics. Not only do they make incredible incredible vegan and cruelty-free cosmetics that last all day and wear very easily, but a portion of every purchase goes back to more than their 300 giving partners so that Thrive can also help communities thrive. 
I have been living for, for quite a while, the Brilliant Eye Brightener. I wear it as my only eyeshadow. I don't have to fuss with brushes or skill. It goes on easily. It wears all day. It shows through my glasses and I always get compliments on it, but it's literally a stick that you can wear to brighten your eye, wear as a shadow. It's very versatile. There are times I even wear it as a liner if I'm going for a less heavily eye-lined look, and I love it. A wide variety of shades. Make sure you're going to find the eye look that you're looking for, and you know that easy is what I live for. So if you are ready to try Thrive Cosmetics for yourself and check out their brilliant eye brightener, you can get an exclusive 10% off your first order at thrivecosmetics.com slash lawnard. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S, dot com slash lawnard for 10 percent off your first order check it out for yourself let me know what you try let's get back to today's episode according to karen reed she woke up around 4 30 a.m on january 29th alone still dressed in what she had on the night before on the couch at o'keefe's house but he was not home she then called mccabe and other friends asked if anyone had seen o'keefe people start calling back and forth to see if anybody had seen him or knew where he was. Reed, the other friend Roberts, and McCabe met up at McCabe's home and then headed to Brian Albert's home. Witness statements indicate that Reed saw O'Keefe's body as they drove up and got out of the car and ran over to him. Others say it was too dark and with the snow, they could not see where he was as they were driving up. She cleared snow off of him, tried to warm him up, and then at 6.04 a.m., Karen Reed called 911. He was transported to Good Samaritan, where he was pronounced dead at 7.50 a.m. Witness reports from Roberts and McCabe indicate that Reed said that she was so drunk that she didn't remember anything from the night before, but she wondered out loud to them whether O'Keefe was dead or had gotten hit by a snowplow, and they noted that when they all went to Albert's home the next morning that they believed Karen Reed was still drunk. They also indicated that while they were driving over to the Albert's house, that Reed was asking, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? And then told the women about the cracked taillight on her black SUV. Prosecutors also state that when asked about the state of John O'Keefe's face, which we will talk about in a moment, she responded to first responders, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Prosecutors also state that there are microscopic pieces of taillight plastic found on O'Keefe's shirt, that DNA from John O'Keefe was found on pieces of the taillight, and that data from the Lexus shows that it reversed at a high rate of speed and kept going. The Massachusetts ME said that O'Keefe was likely incapacitated by severe head injuries, and hypothermia was a contributing factor to his death. It was also reported about the condition of his body. He had two swollen and black eyes, cuts and abrasions, skull fractures, and abrasions on his right arm. We will talk a lot more about the state of John O'Keefe's body because the defense information about what could have happened to him is vastly different from the state's theory of the case. Prosecutors also argue that the grand jury was presented with a substantial amount of evidence. The grand jury came back and indicted Karen Reed on the murder charge, the driving under the influence, and the hit and run. And the prosecution argues that to dissuade or pull away from the defense theories, which they state are exactly that, just theories that aren't founded in a ton of evidence. And we have seen this argument each time they are in court going back and forth and when they were in the motions in limine, the defense was arguing to present evidence of third parties who might be culpable for this murder. And the prosecution was again arguing, look, these are all theories. They are not grounded in evidence. It should be noted that at 9.08 a.m. on the morning of January 29th, 2022, uh, Karen Reed's blood was taken at Good Samaritan and her BAC at that time was between 0.07 and 0.08, but they did a reverse extrapolation of that to determine what her BAC would have been during the relevant time period, and they determined that to be a 0.13 to a 0.29. The defense was arguing last week to keep that information out. Later the afternoon on the 29th, 
state troopers arrived at Reed's home, observed the black Lexus parked outside with a shattered taillight and seized the Lexus and took it to Canton Police Department. They also located two pieces of red plastic taillight and one piece of clear plastic taillight by the Massachusetts State Police Special Emergency Response Team at the home where John O'Keefe was found. Prosecution saying that they dug through the snow to find it. The defense is saying that those were on top of the snow, which with the size of the storm that came in, where and how this plastic was found, either buried in the snow or sitting right on top of the snow is going to be contentious at this trial. So let's talk about the defense's perspective of this case. One of the first things the defense brought forward is that the night of January 29th, 2022, at 2.27 a.m., Jennifer McCabe, who is Brian Albert's sister-in-law, remember that's the house where John O'Keefe was found, made a Google search that says, quote, Hoss, not how, like a mistypo from how, because on your phone keyboard, the S and the W are, are right there under one another. House long to die in the cold. The defense is saying that that search occurring at 227 supports their theory that John O'Keefe was beat up inside of the home and then left in the snow. The defense also alleges that the injuries on John O'Keefe are consistent with him being attacked by the family's German Shepherd. The German Shepherd was subsequently rehomed. The circumstances of that rehoming are after some say the attack on another dog, some say a bite to a person. We will see what comes out at trial. But the dog was subsequently rehomed and Brian Albert's home had flooring changed and then was subsequently sold. But what the defense also argues is that the federal expert and federal reconstruction expert, which we will get to in a minute when we talk about the federal investigation, said that the evidence does not support that John O'Keefe was hit by an SUV and that the damage on the SUV does not support it hitting John O'Keefe. The defense also has been arguing and recently argued in court that they want to present possible third parties who murdered John O'Keefe, including Brian Albert, Brian Albert's nephew, Colin Albert, who the defense alleges had bad blood with John O'Keefe and the prosecution states that that is not supported by any evidence other than Karen Reed's belief that there had been bad blood there and ATF agent Brian Higgins, who they allege had a romantic interest in Reed. And they say that text messages between him and Reed support that. The defense is also alleging that they have a witness who saw Brian Higgins alone with Reed's vehicle outside Canton police station for quote, a wildly long time. And that the video in the area cut out for 42 minutes. Prosecutors argue that that camera is motion censored. So it didn't really cut out that motion wasn't triggering it. And prosecutors argue that earlier in the day, law enforcement had gone to O'Keefe's home to do a welfare check on the niece and nephew, who at this point were at his home alone because Karen Reed had gone back to Brian Albert's house to look for John O'Keefe and that their cruiser vehicle captured damage to Karen Reed's taillight. So in sum, the prosecution is alleging that this was a relationship going south that Karen Reed had had too much to drink and hit him with her car and left him there to die. The defense is arguing that Karen Reed dropped him off at the home of Brian Albert for an ongoing party, that he went inside the home, was beaten up inside the home, attacked by the German Shepherd, and then dragged back outside and left in the snow to die. And that the lead investigator on this case had a close personal friendship with the owner of the home, Boston Police officer Brian Albert, that the lead investigator didn't disclose those relationships, that there's now an investigation into the lead investigator on this case, and that the way this case was handled reeks of a cover-up by law enforcement to protect Brian Albert about what happened in this home. We will see how much of that evidence they will be able to present, but the prosecution has indicated that it will take them probably four weeks to present their case, and the defense has indicated it will take at least two to present their case. I imagine a substantial portion of the defense case is going to come by way of vigorous cross-examination 
And some of that cross-examination is going to be made um, better for the defense and more complicated for the prosecution by this federal investigation. Thank you to our sponsor, Shopify, for making episodes like this and the Law Nerd Shop possible. The entire Law Nerd Shop is powered by Shopify and has been since the very beginning because they make it incredibly easy to set up your shop, whether you're selling in person or online or somewhere in between. And it doesn't matter what phase of business you're at, whether you're just getting started, whether you're opening a brick and mortar location, or whether you're pushing past your first million sales. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, no matter what you're selling. From laundered mugs to your favorite nail polish to Rothy's or Allbirds, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. Plus, Shopify has award-winning help that is there to support your success every step of the way. And with the internet's best converting checkout, you will be turning browsers into buyers with ease. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash lawnard. Remember, that's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash lawnard now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. And start hearing this sound soon. It's no wonder that businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. I know mine has. Let's get back to today's episode. Hey, Emily, isn't it weird that there's a federal investigation and a federal grand jury going on looking into an ongoing case that hasn't gone to trial yet? Yep. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's real weird. Why? Because it's messy. It's not weird because it's messy. It's weird because it's not done and it's not done because it's messy. Having a grand jury, a federal grand jury take place before this trial has even gone forward is wild. A lot of the witnesses called by the federal grand jury from public reports seem to be the exact same witnesses that are going to be called at the trial. And the feds have turned over over 3,000 pages of documents from their investigation into this case. No one has been indicted in connection with that investigation. Remember, grand juries can be investigative. So grand juries can just look into trying to decide or determine what happened or who else should be looked into. But this investigation started to come to light in the news media and caught much more attention when letters between the DA's office and the feds were unsealed and then discussed in open court confirming the investigation, but not who any specific targets are or whether this is just an investigating grand jury. Again, over 3,000 pages of documents turned over by the U.S. Attorney's Office related to their investigation in the case. And in those 3,000 pages, it became clear that they had hired their own reconstruction expert. The defense has stated in filings that O'Keefe's injuries were inconsistent with the damage on the car and that the damage on the car was inconsistent with having made contact with O'Keefe. So if the feds reconstruction expert say that the damage to the victim and the damage to the car don't match those two colliding, um, I have a lot of questions. And would you all be interested in going through the 3000 pages? Well, yes, yes, we all would. Are those court documents? Well, no, some of them are investigative documents, but those have been impounded by the court, meaning that they are sealed, but they will be able to be used in trial to cross-examine witnesses. So if witnesses gave testimony or gave a statement to police and then gave testimony at the state grand jury and then gave testimony at the federal grand jury, there's the potential that some of these witnesses have given three or more statements, at least two of them under oath. And with that, there is always the potential for misstatement, for differences or variances in the statements. And that's going to be the same for Karen Reed's statements as well. There are variances in the things that she's told people and the way that she has told what happened that night that are going to be quite highlighted. She is out of custody pending this trial. I don't know if she will take the stand in her own defense. It will be very interesting if she does because there are multiple statements that she's given, which are all going to come in as a party opponent. But the defense has quite a lot of ground to cross-examine witnesses on, especially the witnesses that were in the house the night of the party. The prosecution argues that John O'Keefe couldn't have been beaten up inside the party because he never went in, his phone doesn't show him ever going in, and his phone was underneath his body, outside, on the ground, because 
the snow had not fallen yet. The snow fell after he was outside. And that wouldn't have been the case if he had gone inside the party, had been beaten up inside the party, and then taken back outside. He would have been on top of snow and then also covered by snow. So when I say the snow is going to play a factor here, how he was found and where his phone was, those things are going to become tremendously important to the state's case. But the statements of the witnesses and the failure to disclose personal relationships is going to be something that's difficult for a jury to get around, I think. There are, again, a lot of questions here. And when you have an accident reconstructionist that wasn't hired by the defense and wasn't hired by the state coming in and saying that this is inconsistent, it's going to be interesting to see how the prosecution gets around that evidence if the defense calls that expert. Because you know the state's going to call their own experts. They're not going to call that expert. So in the mix of all of this, there is also allegations of witness intimidation. There have been defense motions to recuse the district's attorney's office, which, which were denied. There is the judge who, even when the defense and the prosecution agrees, doesn't seem to agree with them. They've all asked for a continuance, and the defense has asked for a continuance regarding testing tissue samples from John O'Keefe's arm. They allege that the damage to his arm looks like animal bites and scratches, not like a road rash from getting pulled by a car. We're going to see a lot of that come up in trial, and they have not been able to test those tissue samples on their own, so they have asked for more time. All of it is setting up a mess if she is convicted and this goes to appeal, but even though the defense and the prosecution have agreed this court has refused to delay this trial, could that still happen? Yes. Until a jury is seated, this trial can still get delayed, and even once a jury is seated, it can still get mistried and delayed if something else comes up, but the judge has seemed very steadfast in moving forward. The layout of the courtroom from the few court hearings I've watched is a little awkward based on where all the different tables are. It's going to be interesting to see how cameras are set up for trial. This, like all trials, the courtroom audio has been via potato, and it has been a little bit difficult to follow some of the hearings because of that. Because there is such a great divide in this case, for those of you that haven't been following it, I think it's going to be pretty easy to come into the case and be like, let's see what the evidence bears out in court. For those who might have been covering it closely, it is going to maybe be a little more difficult to try to put what you know aside and watch this case as potentially a juror. Let's see what the evidence bears out. But even if you know a lot about the case, I always think it's interesting to try to come in with an open mind and say, I want to see how they prove it. I want to see how the state convinces me that this is a second degree murder. And I want to see what the defense says about the state's evidence once it's their turn. And do they poke enough holes in the state's case? Remember, they don't have to prove someone else did it. Do they poke enough holes in the state's case that there's reasonable doubt there? I sure have a lot of questions going into this case. It's why I'm interested in covering it. Because at the end of the day, I don't know what happened on the morning of January 29th, 2022. And I'm very interested to see how these attorneys tell us what happened that morning. And with that, I hope that you uh, look forward to joining me back in live court. I'm not going to get into any more of the stuff aside from this case. After this case is done, if you are curious, I am open to taking a look at everything else that is going on, including a blogger who's been talking about this case getting arrested and more. We can talk about all of that after this jury comes back and take a look at everything else going on around this case. But I didn't want to get all the way down that rabbit hole because I really do want to see how this case plays out in front of a jury. And with all of that, law nerds, we're just about to be back in trial, so... It's more important now than ever to stay hydrated. May your toilet paper be plentiful or your bidet be, you know, not too splashy. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com 
or search your app store for Law Nerd. And you can also follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. Remember, I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I recap all of that for you in quick bits on Monday. And of course, The Emily Show drops on Wednesdays. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.